Good morning. Good morning. Once again, we welcome you to the house of the Lord so that we may have this opportunity to thank and praise him for all that he has done and continues to do for us. Welcome to any of our uh, TV audience. I invite them to please sign the guest book so we know uh, that you have the opportunity to watch. Uh, I think we're back online this morning after a couple of weeks of technical problems, as they say. Uh, the thought today really continues the thought of faith last week, the faith of the centurion. But faith as it plums really the depth really that we face of death. You know, that faith we have in God that death is really but the entry to eternal life and God will be with us in all the things that surround death. And so uh, this morning uh, we worship our God. There will be, to, uh, I know the other thing I was thinking of is that today you may have seen in the bulletin the announcements we've been trying to get together uh, some of the praise group from years before and uh, there's a lot of work to getting that up and running again. So today following the uh, gathering of the offerings before the general prayer uh, between communion and the regular part of the service there will be a praise song uh, that will be sung and so uh, it's not in the bulletin, but uh, like I say, getting things organized and up and running properly is uh, a lot of work, but uh, we'll get there. So uh, that praise song, there will be a pause and then she will sing the praise song solo. So let us begin this morning with the singing of the first hymn, Faith is a Living Power from Heaven, um, on top page three. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me. Amen. God, 
our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We praise our Lord singing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. trust in you, mercifully hear our prayers. Be gracious to us in our weakness, and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning is found in the 17th chapter of the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, beginning at the 17th verse. And here we see one of those Old Testament examples of one of God's cho uh, prophets raising someone from the dead. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him up from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with, by causing her son to die. Then he stretched himself on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the widow said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Here ends our first scripture lesson. Let us now join in singing Psalm 30, found on page 6 of your service book. Sing to you and not be silent. 
second scripture lesson this morning is found in Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia, beginning at the 11th verse. It kind of fills us in on some of the details that happened after he was called by Jesus on the road to Damascus and what happened subsequently. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach to you is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in, Jer in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Later I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praised God because of me. Here ends our second scripture lesson. We join in reading the verse of the day from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. Alleluia! God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Alleluia! Please rise for the reading of this morning's gospel. Our gospel lesson really is a continuation of last week's sermon found in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning at the 11th verse. Soon afterward, and so that's after the healing of the servant of the centurion, soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said, God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. We continue with the children's message. If I invite the younger children to please come forward. You can sit over here. Want to sit over here too? And you won't get in a fight with your brothers. Okay. This morning I brought this along. How many can tell me the name of our church? Tree what, what? Of life. Tree of Life. And notice on our stationery we have what is that? A tree. Well, what else is there that is also very important? Cross. Okay, so when we look at our stationery or a lot of the things we send out, they will have what we call our, our church logo on it. 
and it's of a tree with a cross, and that tree has very special meaning. But now I want to ask you something I learned just this morning, because I guess I didn't pay real close attention. If you look at the window over here, what do you see that's kind of the, the biggest thing in there? A tree. A tree. And that was, does anybody know where that tree was found? No. You see that hand coming down, and whose hand would that be? It's a God. God's. Very good. And God was in the Garden of Eden, and he placed a tree there called, what's the name of our church? Tree. Called the Tree of Life. And then if you look over at this uh, window, you will notice down in the corner, what do we find? We again find the tree, very good, the tree of life. And that's to remind us of the tree that was found, uh, is found in paradise, or we might more commonly call it heaven. And what color is the tree? Green. Green. I'm glad you told me that, because I'm colorblind and I can't tell. But, and I'm green, red colorblind, I have a lot of trouble at stop signs. <laughs> so, but why is it green? because green is the color of life. You know, every winter everything gets kind of brown and yucky, yeah. but then in the spring, all of a sudden, flowers come out and the grass gets green. green because it's the color of life. And so when we think of the name of our church, Tree of Life, we think of the Garden of Eden on the one hand, we think of heaven on the other hand, and we think of how heaven is the place where we will live forever with God. We pray, Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us life and the hope of eternal life with you in your paradise that we call heaven. Amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats. We continue with the singing of the next hymn found on page 6. Your hand, O Lord, in days of old. Thank mm -hmm. you.
grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you in the name of him who is the firstborn from the dead, Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, you know, when I first saw the name of your church, Tree of Life, I kind of paused. It, it uh, certainly wasn't typical or traditional of the names we usually give to new mission congregations. But as I thought about it, I thought, what a beautiful name for a church. You know, you didn't name it as so many of our churches do after one of the saints, Matthew, John, Paul, Luke. You didn't name it one of the more traditional names, Gethsemane, Emmanuel. But you gave it the tree of life. Now, when we think of the tree of life, and I'm sure this is one of the reasons the uh, founders chose this name, was because it has so much meaning. For it was in the Garden of Eden that we first see the tree of life. It was intended that man could eat of its fruit and live forever. We also find the tree of life later at the, in the last book of the Bible mentioned twice. The first time is in John's revelation from Jesus Christ of the letter to the church in Ephesus. And then again in the last chapter, it is mentioned as a description of paradise and the tree of life and how it was bearing its 12 fruits in their seasons, reminding how God nourishes and takes care of his church of all ages. But that tree of life would also cause some problems for Adam and Eve after they had sinned. Because we are told by God that man must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and live forever. Had man been permitted access to the tree of life after he sinned, life would have become for him a curse in a sense, a living hell. But even though we think about life, it is sometimes hard for us to think about life outside the context of our own life here on earth. And I've run across many Christians that in talking to them about heaven and how when we die, we go to live with the Lord, there seems to be a, a little bit of cloud at times about what exactly life will be, to think about it that you and I are going to live forever with God. There will be no death. And so today's focus is upon life as the greatest miracle. And to truly understand life as a miracle, we first of all need to humbly confess that death is a result of sin, but then to see that life is a miracle of grace. You know, last week we heard about the faith of the Roman centurion who sent elders from the church and later friends to meet Jesus and ask that his servant, whom he loved, be healed. And then we're told soon afterward Jesus went to a town called Nain. Nain was a little village a little bit to the north of Capernaum. It may have been within an easy day's walk if we look at a map. And as Jesus went from Capernaum north to Cain, Nain, his disciples went with him. But by this time, Jesus' reputation had spread far and wide, and so we are told that crowds of people came out to follow him. What a sight that must have been to see Jesus and his disciples walking along the dusty road from Capernaum to, to this little town called Nain, and that large crowd of people with him. Very likely, although we're not told exactly, we would assume that Jesus was teaching them things about the kingdom of God which are not written down for us. But we can't see Jesus wasting an opportunity to tell people about God, the kingdom of God, and that he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of a Messiah. As they near the town of Nain, they meet a procession of people. It is unfortunately a sad occasion. 
the only son of a widow has died. She was alone. You know, we've heard it said many times, especially after some type of natural disaster, that it, it, it's just unnatural, it seems to us, that children should die before their parents. A good old German friend of mine in one of my congregations used to say, the alten sterb muss sterben und die junge sterben. The old must die and the young do die. And so this woman, a widow, alone, just lost her only son, is escorting a funeral procession out to what we would call the cemetery. And a large crowd of people from the village and possibly from the surrounding area are with her. It is very common in small towns, I think much more than big cities, that when someone dies, the whole village comes out to mourn with the family. And I guess that is simply because in small towns you know everybody. And so we find a large crowd accompanying the funeral bier, the coffin, accompanying the widow, mourning with her, and also there to comfort her in any way that they can. We've also heard that there are only two things certain in life, death and taxes. But I would contend that there is only one thing certain, and that is taxes. And you all know that. But death, what about death? Death is not natural. You see, Adam and Eve, our first parents were created to live forever. Life is natural. Death isn't. When you think about it, isn't that the hope that we have of living with God forever? Is knowing that we will be taken from this life through the door of death to enter into eternal life with God in that paradise that we call heaven? The tree of life's presence in heaven is a reminder of God's grace and how he is going to restore life to us where we will no longer be able to sin, but we'll live with him in joy of eternal worship. But death is a result of sin. Death would not have entered into this world if Adam and Eve hadn't disobeyed God and eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They had to be banished from the Garden of Eden because had they been permitted to stay in that paradise and eat of the Garden of Eden, their life would have been more of a curse than a blessing because they would have begun to suffer the effects of sin and eventually the body would no longer have been able to continue in blessed health. But what exactly is death? When we think about death or speak about death, normally we think mostly about physical death. When somebody whom we know, maybe a family member, a relative, a friend, expires their last breath, and then comes the funeral. But the psalmist tells us that the average lifespan, your lifespan and mine, is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. And when you hear what the uh, smart people today talk about how long man lives on average, you know that's right in the ballpark. Women live close to 80 years, men a couple years less. So by 80, if they have the strength. Physical death, as we think of it, is the absence of physical blessing. And think of all the physical blessings that the God has given to us. The blessing of family the blessing of friends, the blessing of work, the blessings of a beautiful summer day, the blessing of rain that waters the plants, the flowers, and the trees. Physical death is the absence of physical blessing. But there is another type of death that really only the Christian can understand, and that is spiritual death. Spiritual death is the absence of spiritual blessings. Spiritual death can bring not only sadness, depression, but also despair. Because we people don't have the hope of faith 
in the loving God and the hope of forgiveness in life. And finally, there is what we would call eternal death. Eternal death is the absence of eternal blessings. It's the separation from God and the fellowship of believers eternally. Eternal death, as well as spiritual, is caused by a lack of faith or trust in the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But now we are told when the Lord saw the widow, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Jesus had a plan. He went up and touched the coffin. One thing we notice about Jesus as we did do when later on when Lazarus dies is Jesus' love and compassion. At the death of Lazarus, we are told he wept. And here he had compassion on the widow. She lost her only son just as she had lost her husband. She was alone. And so Jesus has a plan to help her. But when we are told that he went up and touched the coffin, we might have the mental picture of a coffin as we think of it today, maybe sitting in front of the church at a funeral or at the <coughs> funeral home, you know, a box in which our mortal remains are placed until the resurrection. Probably wasn't the type of coffin that's being talked about here. More likely it was like what we would call a stretcher sometimes a funeral beer, B-I-E-R. And then the mortal remains of the one who had passed away were covered with a pall. Or when we think of the Shroud of Turin and how they claimed that covered the body of Christ, it was more just like a large sheet or blanket that would cover the body. And so Jesus goes up to this coffin, this funeral beer, and he does something that he had never done before. He simply touches the coffin and then he tells the corpse to arise. And this was the first miracle that Jesus performed in raising the dead. The result was as predicted. The crowd was filled with awe and praised God. You know, that's easy to read those words and not give a thought, but just think, have you ever been to a funeral? Can you imagine with the casket up here in front? before it's closed, or if it's maybe in the entry or at the funeral home and it still isn't closed, that the pastor would walk up and touch it and say, sit up, and all of a sudden the corpse would sit up. Yeah, I think your jaws would drop too. <laughs> uh, they were in awe. But then this young man sat up. Jesus had restored him to life. You know, life is a miracle. Science has not yet been able to reproduce intelligent life. A doctor will eventually lose all of his patients. They will all die. No matter how far science and medicine has advanced, we know that eventually we will all die. But Jesus loves us so much that he has restored to us the hope of eternal life through the miracle of the resurrection. We can praise God with the words of the Apostle Paul who said, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The miracle of life is indeed a reason for us to praise our God. So let's take a closer look at this miracle. The widow's son would now know again physical life. And physical life is the presence of physical blessings. He would be reunited with his mother. He would once again see the beauty of a dawn or of a sunset. He would be able to sit down with his friends or neighbors and talk with them, eat with them, drink with them, and all the things that we do on a daily basis. The physical blessings that the Lord has poured out upon us in abundance. But our lives are more than the existence of our physical being. 
we are also spiritual beings. We remember how in the Garden of Eden, God created man by breathing into him the breath of life. Man has a soul. Man, soul, is really a special blessing from God. The spiritual blessings that we enjoy by God's grace are such things as faith, that very special love that places others before ourselves, peace, knowing that our sins have been forgiven, hope, patience, just to name a few of the spiritual blessings. And these special blessings are received through Christ. We are blessed spiritually through the word. The spiritual blessings of a relationship to God and a relationship to Jesus Christ, his son, we are in communion or fellowship. We are one with him. These are the blessings which only a believer can enjoy while he is physically also alive. And finally, there is the miracle of eternal life. When Jesus restored the hope of eternal life by rising from the grave on the third day, he also restored the hope of life to all who believe in him as our Lord and Savior. Eternal life is the presence of eternal blessings. Eternal blessings are life in heaven, life with God, and life with all the children of God who have gone before or who will follow us into God's home. Eternal life is a life without the fear of death. There is not the temptation to sin or the consequences of sin that befell Adam and Eve after they had sinned. When we read the Revelation, John describes some of the thoughts what eternal life will be when he says God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be the tears of sadness and sorrow. There will be the eternal joy and happiness that come from God. There will be no more death. You know, we live with death every day. But in heaven there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. <laughs> when you get to be in your late 60s, uh, you realize what a blessing that will be. And the old order of things has passed away. Because eternal life is communion with God, Eternal life is a restoration of all the blessings that were lost in the Garden of Eden. Eternal life will be living with God in his eternal home. So life is the greatest miracle. Life is really the fulfillment of our hopes and dreams, physical, spiritual, and eternal. Life brings with it joy and happiness. These are the blessings when that come to mind when we hear the name of your church, our church, Tree of Life, Evangelical Lutheran Church. We are reminded of the first tree of life in the Garden of Eden and the tree of life which will be there in paradise when one day we cross over to be with God. This is the message that we have to share, both now, here in Cary, and eternally. May the Lord bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join with me now in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 9 of your worship bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and a life that everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as the ushers hand out the friendship registers and then as we receive your gifts for the work of the Lord.
please rise as we continue now with the order or uh, with the prayer for the church found on page 10 of your service folder. And this morning we are going to also remember, we've heard in the news this week of the 10 and 11 year old children who are waiting lung transplants and we're just reminded of all those people out there who are not enjoying the same blessings of physical life that we may enjoy. And it's an opportune time for, to, for us to think of them in our prayers. O oh Lord our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise, we praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church and all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your zeal and your hope. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants in our worthy and honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your creative order. Give us teachers and students who pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. And dear Lord, we come into your presence this morning thinking of the blessings, the physical blessings you have given to most of us. And we are reminded that not everyone has been blessed with the same health that we have. And so we come to you reminded that some children are suffering diseases today that uh, a need for a lung transplant makes it necessary for them to continue to enjoy physical life on earth. But dear Lord, there are not only children in need, but many others who are in need of the donation of organs so that they may continue a more uh, enjoyable life here on earth. And so we pray that all of us be conscious of organ donor transplants and that we include those in need in our prayers. We also pray for the families that they may find strength and that they may turn to you, knowing that you are the giver of all good things and that they also may know you as their Lord and Savior in whom is the hope of eternal life. So hear us, O Lord, now as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. We pray, our, our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the order of Holy Communion as it is found on the top of page 12 of your worship bulletin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock 
until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and host of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me in the same way also after supper he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins this do whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. the guests may come forward as directed by the ushers. You may be seated. Take and eat. This is his body, which is given to you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is his blood, which is given to you for the forgiveness of sins. May this body and blood strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Go knowing your sins are forgiven. Amen. It 
this body which was given for you and this blood which was shed for you, strengthen and preserve you in the true and saving faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. for you in this blood which was shed for you, strengthen and preserve you in the true and saving faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. given to you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. And this body which was given for you and this blood which was shed for you, strengthen and preserve you in the true and saving faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for the forgiveness of all your sins. May this body which was given for you, and this blood which was shed for you, strengthen and preserve you in the true and saving faith. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven.
please rise and we'll sing the Song of Simeon on page 15. Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hear now the words of the High Priest Aaron which have been spoken in the Lord's Church for nearly 3,500 years. The Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we close with the singing of the final hymn. Amen. 